Hey everyone, uh, I'm Gabrielle G.B. Blackwell. I am a manager of sales development at Culture Amp and uh, super excited to be here on the SDR Game Podcast. Today, we are going to talk about how you can stand out in the hiring process, even if you have no sales experience or college degree. G.B. interviewed over 700 candidates and hired more than 60 SDRs in the last few years. This is the SDR Game Podcast, the podcast to speed up your sales career and build more pipeline. In this episode, you are going to learn more about the SDR hiring process straight from the perspective of a hiring manager. What are the key skills assessed, tips on how to stand out from the ground, and the common mistakes and how you can avoid them. Welcome to the show, actually, uh, GB. Uh, super excited to have you on the show today. Awesome. Let's start with uh, the first question. Um, so we're going to focus obviously on the hiring process, but the first question is, uh, could you list the top three soft and hard skills uh, you focus on in SDR candidates? In terms of like the three soft, I don't even want to say that they're skills, but the things that I'm really looking for out of a candidate apply for an SDR position is drive. And the way that I break this down is threefold. And within drive, you have... Uh, there's a need for achievement or the need to attain. Uh, there is um, taking thrill and competition. It's not being cutthroat, right? It's just like, all right, how how much better can I get and can I beat out what I did yesterday? And the third part of this is optimism. So it's a steep seated belief that like no matter what, they believe in their abilities to succeed. So that's really what I'm looking for. Um, the number one thing that I look for from like a quote unquote soft skills kind of perspective. I'm also looking for a level of coachability and eagerness. So this can look like someone, uh, I don't even just want to say like coming in prepared with questions, but I'm curious, like I'm looking at the kinds of questions they're asking. Um, Is there follow-up? If there is moments to provide coaching, let's say there's a mock interview towards the end when I'm giving feedback, do they just kind of sit there and receive it? Or are they like asking qualifying questions and asking me to like provide feedback when they actually put it into action. And even in the mock interview themselves, if I am providing feedback and we do another mock, are they applying it? So those are really like kind of the big three things that I, I care the most about. So I said, what drive coachability, right. And that eagerness to learn. And then in terms of like the actual hard skills, um, I will say that over the past few years, what I am curious about, more and more. And I don't know if it's a hard skill necessarily, but I'm really curious about how people think about things. So we're looking at like critical and strategic thinking, Um, especially if you're going for an outbound SDR role. I want to see like how you think about attacking a book of business. So in terms of kind of like quote unquote harder skills, it's like book management and account prioritization and lead prioritization. I also want to see like how you go about research and infusing that into, let's say, an email sample that we're asking you to provide or a phone call or a, a, a mock call too. So these are a couple of things that I, I'm going to be really, really curious about. And so it's more so the application of that critical and strategic thinking within the lens of prospecting, research, and of course, like the actual copy or correspondence that we're going to be sending to prospects. I have a lot of follow-up question on that. Uh- Actually, if I, that was one of the questions of uh, Darjan Mihalovsky, actually on LinkedIn. So he was asking specifically that the top things that you are looking for into a candidate. Before we go on the follow-ups, uh, on the questions, uh, I want to ask first, how do you um, differentiate uh, candidates with experience and no experience? I'm asking you that because I imagine at some point, companies when you have already on the onboarding or the enablement program in place, I think the answer can be different, but how do you think about that for, for SDR candidates? What I've seen at the past few companies that I've been at is hiring managers um, and more specifically higher ups in the organization will over index on experience as the main qualifier. I think the challenge though is, and there's no shade to folks who are going from one SDR position to the next because you just don't know what the, like what their circumstances were that led them into the job search again. I do believe that one of the shadow sides or one of the risks that an organization can open themselves up to is you have folks who, yes, they have experience in the role from a title perspective, but if they did not perform in that role, their experience means nothing to me. So what... What I care about the most as a hiring manager is it goes back to those qualifiers that I talked about, right? I want to see that somebody has that drive so that they have a track record of achievement 
if someone has experience in the role, it just becomes very clear. You were in a role, that was a sales role, walk me through how you performed. So what I'm really looking for is do they have command over their business? So, does, so I wanted to know that they actually know their numbers, like they know how they attained, right? So when I'm like, cool, what was your average attainment? And if someone says, I don't know, I'm like, yes, you you have experience, but to me, you are not demonstrating that you are experienced as a sales professional. So there are there's a certain kind of level of I don't just want to say professionalism, but command over their business that I expect from an experienced hire. But I, in terms of what this means for somebody who doesn't have SDR experience, who might not who might not have sales experience, I can say the same thing. Like, hey, you know, in your past roles, right, and or past experiences, it could be in school, it could be in sports, it could be in um, like volunteer activities. What I'm really looking for is how, like, what was expected of you, and how did you perform against that? It, did you overachieve? Like, did you achieve? Did you overachieve? Did you do a little bit something extra? Were you selected for leadership positions and whatever you're doing? So I, what I'm really just looking for on that one is I want to see a track record of success. And, and when I say track record, I mean, I want to see multiple examples of different environments or continued um, achievement, overachievement against a goal. So I, I really do look at it the exact same way between an experienced hire and an inexperienced hire. Like, hey, this is what I'm looking for, period. The only difference is what does it look like for an experienced hire versus an inexperienced hire, right? So inexperienced hire might say more so school, sports, maybe if they're coming out of college, right? Um, or they'll say, hey, I was a recruiter. And so here's how I measured against my peers. But I, and so for someone who's coming from a sales position, right? They're going to have something similar, but it's just going to be within the context of a sales role. I have a question for you specifically about Connie's, where they are at another company. Uh, do you add another layer to the traits you are looking for? Because I'm asking you that because, for example, for me, um, I'm doing something similar, like you said, but for SDR candidates who are already has, as they have SDR experience, I'm going to check if they are also adaptable because the main issue that I had with the past in the past with those type of candidates, the issue was they are used to do the things in certain way. And then when they join your company, they start doing the same thing that they were doing at the previous. So for example, I, um, at Chili Piper, I had someone on my team who was um, working at Zendesk. He was the top Uh, number one is yeah at Zendesk, but then when he joined Chili Pepper, he was really struggling because obviously the I don't know how many SDR they have at Zendesk, but at least 200 of uh, in the world. And at Chili Pepper, we had like maybe 15, 20 reps. So obviously the size of the org is not the same, but the support uh, that the company will give to their team won't be similar. So something I try to assess on is uh, can they adapt also if they are moving from a big company to a small one. Yeah, I think this gets into like kind of what I was mentioning about coachability, well as eagerness, but as well as like kind of the critical and strategic thinking too. And and I think a, a prerequisite of critical thinking is curiosity. And so what I have observed is when looking at candidates who have experience, um, and especially if they're coming from larger organizations. What I really want to understand is what was like, what did prospecting look like for your organization or for you at that organization? Who like, how did you know what to work and when to work them? Were you building out your own list of accounts? Were you sourcing your own accounts or were they given to you? Like walk me through the complexity of the kinds of personas that you were going after and how, like what was your talk track and how did you adjust for that? Now walk me through your research, right? Because Just because I've seen candidates come from very large organizations where, and again, there's no shade to this, and I'm not saying it's better or worse, but what I see is with so much structure, what ends up happening is they don't actually, folks might not need to develop that, like the ability to think for themselves. How do, I'm looking at my book of business, I need to decide which accounts I'm going to go after, but instead they're given 10 accounts and they just have to call through them. So when you put them into an environment where they now have to take like 75% more ownership of their book of business, but they're treating being treated as an experienced hire, they're going to be set up to fail. So I don't know that it's necessarily a matter of like a lack of a adaptability, but it's much more about like, to me, it's much more about the critical thinking, right? So it's like, 
is this somebody who just wants to come into an organization and like hit the easy button, clock in, clock out? And if you're at a smaller company, that's not going to work, right? Or is this somebody who's like, again, going back to the drive thing, like they need to achieve very highly, right? So if they're not working out, they're going to employ like the the skills of curiosity and critical thinking, and they're going to think about things differently, and therefore they're going to be more adaptable. But I, I think one of the things that hiring managers can do. I don't know if this is a, I don't know if the audience is a hiring manager, but one of the things that I know I will do as a hiring manager is I will really dig into somebody's process of like, all right, cool, you were successful at this company. What would you attribute that to? Walk me through your strategy. How did you prioritize your day? How did you know to do that? And so if they don't have good answers or if they don't have any answers at all, this lends me to believe they don't actually know what made them successful. So therefore, they're not going to know how to set themselves up truly to be successful if things don't work out at this company. So I, that that's really what I want to see happen is like, do they have the ability to prop? Oh. The um, drive, need for achievement, improvement and optimism, is it from the book, um, never hire? Never hire a bad salesperson. Yet. Yeah, because I remember when I read, reading it, actually yep. the question on, on the traits about candidates with no experience, that was a question also from Juliana Kifler johnson so thank you, Juliana, for asking this question. Now let's talk about your pro- your hiring process at Kurt Hem, actually, because the, I wanted to start with the traits because I think uh, it's important to understand what you're looking for and then how you assess uh, your candidates, for the candidates in the hiring process. So what's the hiring process uh, at your company? There are there are traits and attributes that we're going to be looking for. Everything, what, what I... Um, if there's at other companies and I will say like I didn't come up with the hiring process at Culture Amp and then getting more involved in it but more often than not the hiring process at every company I've been at has been the same you have a recruiter screen a hiring manager interview or, or a hiring manager screen then you will move on to a mock inter- mock cold call you may or may not need to submit like some kind of written copy to demonstrate your copy abilities and then you will either meet with like a cross function, you'll do a cross functional interview, right? And or you will meet with like the hiring manager's boss, like to meet with like senior leadership at the organization. And then you'd move to offer. So like those are the steps. Now, in terms of like what we're trying to do from a from a hiring manager front or from the from the interview panel front is uh, there are certain competencies that are going to be seen as essential for the role. So like what I talked about, like there's mindset, there's uh, drive, there's, so these are, it's not necessarily a, str- a competency necessarily, but it's like, here are the attributes that are going to pull into the competencies, but like from the higher, so from the recruiter screen, what we really want to make sure is that this person essentially kind of meets the requirements like of the role. So like uh, if you're a U.S.-based company and you cannot sponsor somebody who is not a U.S. C- citizen, like we want to make sure that like, hey, if we bring you through, we can actually hire you. We're meeting logistically for the comp, right? You're in the right place. And then you also just like know which role you're hiring for, right? So it's a check mark. And then you meet some of the, the baseline things that we need. The hiring manager interview is more so like let's assess on motivations for the role, fit for the role. We also want to, I'll be real with you, like as a hiring manager, I also want to see how do I get along with this person? Because yep. I mean, I need to be best friends with him, but I'm like, if we don't communicate well on the on the interview process, like that's going to have an impact if this person joins the team. So I also, I'm kind of assessing for like communication skills, curiosity, motivation, desire to be in the role, desire to be in sales as well. Um, so it's like all those intangibles for the mock call, what I'm really assessing for is, let me be honest, the biggest thing that I really care about is can you follow instructions? Like if we're giving you a prompt. And then I also want to see, like, I also want, I, I'm more so curious about how do you go about your research? How do you go about your discovery? Those are really the two big things that I want to see. And then thirdly, let's say I want to see coachability too. So we'll do two mock calls in the interview with me. And let's say if, give you feedback between the first and the second and you don't apply it in the second call it's a no because i'm like all right this is what it's going to be like when you come on board if i give you feedback give you coaching and this is what i get it's a no for me dog right so like that's really what i'm seeing is you take information and apply it and then also i'm curious about your eagerness for coaching and feedback as well and then in the the, the other parts of the interview it's more so just making sure that the hiring manager doesn't have happy ears, right? So like having somebody who's not necessarily involved in the team, 
is off to the side, checking for more so from like a cultural team impact perspective. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Like those are really those are really the big things and a little bit of like just kind of professional presence as well. Let's talk about you, you are saying research and discovery for the mock call. So um, uh, you do that. The mock call is on the third interview, right? The first, you, because you have the screening interview. Yeah. Um, so on the mock call, we don't need to give all the details, obviously, but uh, the, I want to understand, um, do you send them before the interview where they need to prepare? Um, so what's the process here? The mock interview will be, or the mock part of the uh, candidate journey is going to be something that's going to be in between 30 and 45 minutes time on the calendar. Um, and so uh, we will send over a prompt, like as soon as that person is scheduled for the next step, like they'll get the prompt. And so they'll say, hey, like you're going to be reaching out to this company going after this persona and like, and here's, and they'll get a rubric of what they're going to be assessed on. Right. And they'll be given some guidance as to what it sounds like or what it looks like, or how do you know if you're doing a good or like if you're doing a good job or if you're not meeting the mark. Right. So there will be some of that. And then, and that's really, that's the prompt. Right. So, and then it's like, all right, the expectation is that you would have sent this person an email um, they responded back saying, Hey, I've got a few minutes. So it's more of a warm call than a full on cold call. And so that's the prompt. And then when we're actually getting to the mock call experience, right, what I'll do is you know, check to see if they have any questions, make sure that they got the prompt because sometimes technology is not fun and doesn't go through or whatever. And, um, so I'll answer any questions. We'll set the scene and then we'll get into it. And so I, as the hiring manager, will assume the role of the prospect. We'll turn our cameras off, right. And they're going to call me. And so what I'll say is, again, like the things that I'm really assessing people on, it's one, I want to see, um, I'm curious about how they, what what they look at in their research and how they infuse that into the call, into the call opener relevance. Then I want to see the level of discovery that they do. And I'm not talking about an AE discovery where we need to like come up with budgets and next steps, know exactly what the solution is going to be. But it's more about like identifying a potential problem, right? Or a potential gain for the prospects in, in like, finding a need that culture amp could potentially satisfy for. Um, I, and so like, I want to see how they go about that. Then based off of that information, based on the discovery, how they align that to the value proposition of culture amp. I'll throw some objections at them. I want to see how they handle it. And then of course I want to see a strong close. Right. So those are really the big things that I'm assessing on. And then um, again, we'll, we'll do like, we'll do a round of feedback, right. We'll just, there'll be a self-reflection plus I'll give them, feedback based off of how they performed in the first one and then we'll do it again and then we'll get feedback so that's what the mock call looks like for the second role play do you practice the whole call again or just the parts where you are giving feedback i do the whole thing oh the whole thing okay. like i've seen other managers um do it where they only practice the one part they gave feedback on i think it actually lets the rep off the hook because i want to see it all in context yeah right so if i just say like Hey, you, you struggle. It's different if someone's on my team, like if someone's on yeah. my team, they yeah. had a cold call, they struggled with an objection, right? Cool. Rapid fire. Let's just practice the objection until you feel confident and I feel confident in it. But it's a different scenario, right? It's like, I was like, Hey, I need to make sure that when I'm giving you a piece of feedback, I want to see how you're able to apply it quickly. Cause that to me is how I'm assessing for coachability. So people, so sometimes people get lost. They're like, all right, I'm going to apply this feedback and they, and then the rest of the call falls apart. Right. So like if I had only assessed on that one small piece, they would have aced it. Then I end up having folks on my team later on where they're like, actually, I don't know how to apply this in the full context of my job. So I, I always do full call and, the, and, the, and when we're doing the calls too, like the mock call doesn't last more than five minutes. Right. So it's not like we're doing 15, 20 minute calls. It's it's five minutes. Like most of the time it's five minutes. Yeah. If not, if if not less. And for the research, I wanted to go back on that. Uh, because do you assess also the business the business acumen of the person? So you are talking about the strategic thinking. So uh, for example, try to see you are talking about the research are doing, but you want to see do they understand the problem that culture is solving, for example, uh, uh, are solving. Uh, stuff like that or what's the what are you looking for what i'll see happen is reps will or candidates will come in and they've done zero research they've done research but they didn't, it didn't show up anywhere in the call right so i'm like hey like what research did you do 
And they're like, and so maybe they're like, oh my gosh, I told, like, I got nervous. You know what I mean? And then we do it again and it's so much better. Like, that's one thing. Some people don't do any research at all. And I'm like, okay, like that shows me how you're going to show up with prospects. So like, that's a no. But then there are some times where people, um, I think people will look for things and so they'll bring up nebulous topics, right? Like, hey, uh, so again, we're going, so Culture Amp, we're selling the HR technology most of the time. And so the, the prompt is you're going after a chief human resources officer and we know what the company is. Uh, I can do a quick bit of research and I realize like I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm like, hey, if I can quickly go and see like one or two things this company is doing just by Google search alone and you didn't add any of that into your call whatsoever, like it's kind of a no, it's like a no for me. I'm being really honest. So like, I, I just want to see that people are actually doing some level of research, even if they don't apply it in the right way. That's OK. But I just want to see that they did the work to actually research. And then, to, so like to me, there's a difference between somebody who gets a yes, like a three out of four, and someone who gets a strong yes, there's a four out of four, right? So someone who gets like a three out of four is like, hey, like they they found a couple of things of research um, that might not have been the big thing, but they do a, they do a, a, a good enough job on discovery. They got their engage, they got an engaging tone. They're curious. They find a problem. They handle some objections pretty well, and they drive to a close. And then, right, we do it all over again. And so they, you know, like they have a they have a good one. They're able to implement feedback that I'm giving them. That's great. A four to me is someone who's like, hey, I saw the company was growing. I saw that you were hiring for these positions. For example, like what is the impact to your HR practice given all of these growth? I'm like, oh, snap, that's a four, right? Like they're doing, ex- they're doing a phenomenal job. And I probably don't have too much to coach them on, right? So like, I'll be honest with you, there are some people who come through and they do such a good job on the first mock that we end up just like kind of talking about ways, like I'm just like praising them. And then we try and figure out like, all right, how, if at all, could you've gotten better maybe? But um, we might only do one round. I'm like, that was so good. There's really no point. So like, I'm so impressed. But there's no point in doing another one. So like for some people, they sh- they really do a really great job and they inspire a lot of confidence because they're able to like show that they've done a little bit of work to understand what's going on at the company. How does the value prop align? Or even some of these folks are, they'll reach out to reps who are at the company already and ask for advice on how to do well in the mock. I'm like, great, you're resourceful. You're thinking critically about this. You're really curious too. Like I can tell how much work you invested into this. And that is a, and I, I think that's really what we're assessing is like, how much work are you willing to put into this job? And the mock is a really good to me, like, um, uh, like barometer for that. For example, that's a no for someone who is uh, not preparing. Is it like a red flag? So if they don't prepare anything, that's a no, uh, you end the interview or what's your? For me specifically, it is. And I will say it, it probably just depends on the kind of company that you're applying for. So like if you're applying for, um, and this is important to know this and hopefully we've sussed this out and in the in the hiring manager interview. But again, for me, what I'm doing during a hiring manager interview is I'm trying to understand how much of like, uh, let's say if somebody has experience or even if they're inexperienced, what I'm trying to figure out is what is our learning curve going to be when they get into the, jo- into the job? Because like, it's great not, like, listen, I'm sure everybody in the world and their mother and their dad and their cousin like they could all figure out how to do the SDR job role eventually. I'm sure they can. But the problem is I need folks to come in and, and we need to get them like up and running and dangerous in three months or less. Right. So if someone's learning curve is six months, nine months, that's not going to work. Yeah. So. Right. So. So. Uh, so the things that I'm, I'm really trying to figure out first and foremost are like, what is somebody's potential learning curve? based off of their current skill set, but also based off of their willingness and eagerness to do really well. So if they're showing up to a mock cold call and we're like, hey, here's the company, here's the here's the CR, CHRO, right? And within the prompt itself, it's like, we are going to assess you on research and here's an example of what research looks like. And you show up and you have not done any research you are not moving forwards. You didn't follow instructions. And I'm not saying that, you know, when somebody gets into the role, am I going to say, hey, like, if you don't do this, then you're out? No, like, I'll leave a lot more room for empowerment. But I'm like, from an interview setting, I need, 
one, it's a bet. It's like we're all just hedging our bets as hiring managers to try and figure out like who do we feel most confident in can get it that like, can get in, do well, and and get up to speed. And, and based off of what we have available to us at this company, right? Like because people who've done really well at SDR positions at other companies might not do well at our our organization just because of the resources that we have or don't have. So what I'm really just trying to do is figure out like who are the best candidates for this position, like for for what we have today. And it's for culture in particular, and what I've seen at past organizations I've worked at, it's about a thousand people, is like there's a lot of stuff that we're still figuring out. And so we need people who are willing to go a little bit above and beyond to make up for the things that we don't have available to them that bigger companies do, right? So if you're coming in and you're expecting like, hey, I'm going to be given the answers, it's going to be a really rough experience for the person coming on board and their manager. From your experience, what's the biggest mistake that is yeah making during the hiring process? I can give you an example. So right now it's, if you ask me a few years ago, I would, I would say it's something different. But for me right now, one mistake I see, it's, um, I don't know for you, when you give them time for asking any questions at the end, they are always asking the same question. So I have like maybe 80%, 90% of the candidates, they ask, hey, what's the quota attainment of the team? Uh, what, uh, what's the day-to-day of Anesia? And it's, I think it was great a few years ago because no one as, were asking this question. But now if you have, if you are, interviewing 10, re- 10 candidates per week or 20 and you have the same questions, no one is standing out in terms of questions. I actually, if someone goes, hey, like, tell me more about like, all right, uh, what does quota look like and how many reps are attaining? And like, I, I don't think that those are bad questions in and of themselves. I think they can be layer. People can layer in more questions onto that. So depending on like, so for my team, right? Like for my team. So I just want to see like, all right, are you just asking these questions because you read it somewhere? Or are you asking these questions for discover, like for discovery purposes, right? So getting back to the kind of like, to me, it's a signal of how are you going to do when you're with a prospect? So if it's like, oh, hey, like 100%, I want to like, I wish my team was hitting 100% right now. But let's say like my team's not, my team has not hit 100%, right? And so if they say that, I want to hear, I'm like, they might go, okay, I don't want this role anymore. Or they can ask me more questions of like, hey, like, what do you think is getting in the way? And like, what's going to be really important? And how does that impact the kinds of candidates, right, that you're looking for when you're interviewing? So, like, if you have me sitting back in my seat going, hmm, right, like, I'm like, okay, great. That's what you would do with a prospect as well. So, I think the the opportunities for the questions, it's like, it's not a bad thing that you're asking the same questions that everybody else is. It's just, just go, just go further than everybody else does. Yeah, because you are generating, you are really curious about understanding what's happening instead of, just asking your three questions uh, that you are asking because, so yeah, maybe that's the way I said it, but yeah, that's because the way they were doing it, they was more in the sense of, uh, oh yeah, I asked the quota attainment, then the day to day of Indonesia, and that was it. They are not curious about what's happening. I think there are certain questions that I, I do hope and I would encourage people to, to discontinue asking like, Hey, like, what are the top traits? What do you think are the top traits that make an SDR? I just start asking people this question. I'm like, what do you think they are? Like, cause you can Google that, right? Like, okay. Or like, Hey, um, what do you think the biggest challenges are of SDRs today? I'll be like, what do you think they are? You're applying for the role. Did you do any research? I think the most important thing is what is your intention in asking the questions? Like, what are the, what is the objective of you asking the question? If the intention or the objective is oh, I know I need to ask three questions. And so I'm going to just ask these three questions and boop, 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 done, right? And even why I care about intention objective is, as a hiring manager, here's what I know, is there's a lot of people looking for a job. There's a lot of people who can't pay their rent. And I will say, and, it's, and there's no shade to that, right? However, I just want to make sure that when I'm bringing somebody onto the team, it's not just that they're trying to pay their rent and trying to pay their bills, right? I want to know that, hey, based off of what they care about, about their career, that this opportunity is going to align to what they're trying to accomplish in their career. So it's like, one, I want to know that this SDR role is actually a role they want to do and that they're aware of what they're getting themselves into, right? So have they actually researched the role and next, do they have a strong why? But I'm like, I want to, I want to know what their why is, and I want to know how they think about the SDR role supporting that, because that to me shows there's a certain level of reflection 
and self-awareness. And that could feed big time into like, it's going to have an impact on motivation and their willingness to do the role over time, especially when things get really hard. And then I also want to see like, so like with that, for them to be able to answer that question, they need to have researched the SDR role deeply, right? They need to have like known what they were getting themselves into. Like when I was applying for an SDR role and I saw cold call, cold email, and I was like, golly, is this what I'm, is this what my life is now that I'm going to call strangers for money? But it was tied to a bigger why. I was like, this is what I'm going to do because it's going to take me, like, here's how I envision my career for the next 20 or 30 years. So a year or two of cold calling means nothing in the grand scheme of my career. Let's get it. Let's have some fun. So if people aren't thinking like that, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to hire them for my for my company or for my team anyways. That might be for somewhere else. But I want to make sure again, because I'm like, I'm going to invest a lot of time and energy and effort into this person. And if they're not even willing to invest the time, energy and effort to figure out if this is the right role or the right company for them, what are we doing? So like, I, so I think there's, there's certain questions that signal to me that either one, and, and I will say this, like I'll, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt and I'll give them coaching at the end of these interviews too. Like if I see a red flag that would cause me to say no, I will give people feedback of like, hey, you know, when you ask these kind of questions to me, here's how it can be perceived. Like it can be perceived that you haven't done your research, right? This might not be the right role or, hey, you know, one thing that I'm, you didn't do any research on this company. Help me understand how many, inter I'll ask people a question. How many interviews have you had today? And they'll be like, I've had six. I'm like, okay, it's giving that impression, right? I'm like, I would encourage you to slow down so that you can actually show up as your best for the kinds of opportunities that you want. Like if you get stuck in the rat race of interviewing, you'll just come off like a rat. So like, yeah, so I, I think there's just, there's certain things, just kind of interview best practices that oftentimes get missed. So it's like slowing down, being present, having done your research, like the things that I, there there are things that I wish I saw more candidates do that were kind of like showing up more. Like if you were a sale, if you were like a, somebody who's trying to work at a company that sells to salespeople, like being at Gong, for example, for a moment in time there, everybody and their mother wanted to work at Gong. Like Gong was the it company if you were a salesperson. And so what this means is you have the best of the best of the best talent apply like literally hammering down like beating the doors down so you even if you were really good at your last company you were a small fish in a huge ocean going at gongs so remember like um I had one guy who like he was fine he was great but I was like hey actually it's like it's a not it's a not for me dog and he's like why and I was like you need to know who you're competing against the kinds of candidates that you're competing against so I'm like, the candidates that I see who are making it further, they're the ones who are like sending emails, sending videos to hiring managers, uh, who are reaching out directly to recruiters uh, and hiring managers as well. Like if, you're, if they're applying for an SDR role, they're prospecting to the sales managers and the sales directors and the CROs. They're the ones who are also doing bottom-up prospecting. So they're reaching out to other SDRs of the organizations, other AEs, like they're reaching out yeah. to AEs of the organizations, try and get like 10, 15 minutes to get a better feel of the culture, a better feel for the targets and rep attainment, a better feel for like, what does the day-to-day -day look like? Um, but also they're leveraging those connections to get them in the door because a lot of companies have <gasps> referral bonuses as well. So they're, they know how to work the system too. And then on top of that, so then as they're gathering insights, gathering intel, when they're showing up to interviews, they are a hundred steps ahead of the rest of the talent who's coming through. So like for me, where just given the fact that a lot of, uh, I'll say this, a lot, there are a lot of hiring managers out there who have very few spaces on their team and who have also did that whole thing of like, all right, we're going to hire a bunch of people who are just excited. And they've learned the hard way that not everybody who's excited about the opportunity is going to be excited about doing a great job at the company. So the standards are raised, right? Like people are vigilant. And so they want, they, there is an expectation of I'm gonna be honest, like there's an expectation. You have to be really great and you have to be really eager. You have to do your research. You have to make sure that when you're applying for a role, you're actually excited about that company, you're excited about that opportunity. And it's not just you interviewing just to interview. Yeah, exactly. Because like you were saying, you are talking about Gong as an example, but 
it's the mindset you need to have as a candidate thinking about that you are maybe against 300 candidates and what you should do to, to I know uh, that's the word that everyone is doing, but to stand out because how, do you, how, how are you going to compete with 300 candidates? And that's the job of the SDR, right, too. It's like you have to stand out as a rep. So like we, I, I want to see that during your interview process as well. And I know, I don't know, I, I, I would imagine like some people could probably listen to this episode and be like, uh, GB, just some stuck up hiring manager, whatever. Like, I promise I'm not trying to be entitled or like superior. I'm really not. I really want to be like, hey, listen, there is just the number one lesson that I would give to people is like, hey, you know, just first and foremost, review what is your why behind this? What, and so what is your objective? And, and these are skills that align very well to a sales position, right? When you're reaching out to a company, what's the relevance? What's your why? Are you just running down a list and you sound like everybody else, right? But it's like AEs need to do the same thing. They're going to prep for a conversation before they go in to make the best use of time and then to also make sure that they're getting the information they need to decide what do they want to do next. So like this is not just me trying to be like a, a jerk or an a-hole, just be an a-hole, but it's like, hey, like the interview process is the closest, like there's the mock, right? That's like, hey, let's assess how you're going to do on a cold call. But the how you manage the interview process is actually the assessment to see, can you do this job? So like if you're approaching the interview process half ass, my my takeaway is that you're going to approach like the SDR job half ass. I have uh, one last question. So the first one is from Franklin Madsen. So he was a Commenting on the post, so he was asking, as a candidate without a college degree, what you can do to stand out? What's your reply to that? For me, I can share that I don't check the, uh, the degree if, I, if, there, if someone has a college degree, so that's not important for me. But I know it's important for some hiring managers. The things that I care about the most are going back to like the need to achieve, right? The optimism, the thrill of competition as well. And so, and also here's my take is if you are, so I, I used to coach or teach at a, um, an organization that helped people transition uh, into or break into tech sales, right? So it was the majority of my students, underrepresented minorities, also underrepresented from a socioeconomic perspective, right? So I had folks on my, like I had folks in my class who had no, who had zero sales experience and also folks, like, I think I had someone on my uh, in my class who didn't even graduate high school and was like finishing their GED program, right? Just for context. And one of the things that I, one of the questions they would always say is go, they would say, Hey, listen, Gabrielle, I've been interviewing and I keep on hearing back from folks that they're not hiring because I don't have experience. And what I would say to them is, can you change the fact that you don't have experience? They're like, no, not right now. I can't. Right. So like, so that, that cannot be the reason why you're not getting the job. Because if that was true, you would never apply and nobody would ever work in sales, right? So I was like, so if you cannot, if you, if you cannot change it while you're doing your interview process, that cannot be the reason why you don't get the job. What you have to do, though, is recognize how might this be perceived and then get ahead of it, like prevent objection. So, for example, I know for myself, like if I have somebody who comes through and they have they don't have a college degree, one I probably am not going to look at it and I don't care, right? That's just me. But like for some folks, one of the reasons why they might not have gone to college is because they needed to work to take care of their family, for example, right? So tell a story that demonstrates like achievement, that demonstrates hard work, that demonstrates the need to like the, the need to like compete, for example. So it might be like, hey, listen, like in high school, here are the kinds of things that I did, right, to get better. Or here's the ways, the kind of impact that I was able to have in my community. Or, hey, listen, one of the reasons why I did not, like, it is actually don't, I don't care if you went to college. Like, I will say that. What I care more about is, can you tell a compelling story that gets me bought into you? So, like, if you have a strong motivation around, like, all right, hey, here's my wife, we're getting into sales. I don't need an explanation of why you went to college or not. Don't care. But what I, I just, I care more about, hey, listen, come in prepared with stories and examples, multiple, that highlight how you are driven, how you are coachable, and how you are eager. If you demonstrate those characteristics, that's what I care about the most, right? But 
I will say this, like if you come in and you don't have like you don't have experience or you don't have a college degree and you don't come in ready to interview and ace the interview, right? You're not getting the job. So it's not going to be because you didn't have experience and it's not because you didn't have a college degree. It's because you did not come in prepared to ace this interview. Right. So I've, I've, I've given so many tips, right? Like reaching out to other or like to reps who are in C, getting the downloads, you know, reaching out sales directors, getting people bought in, uh, bought into you, right? And advocating for you to the hiring manager. Um, there are other things that you can do, like creative outreach, whether it's creating a video, you know what I mean? Or I've seen people get turned down from a job once and they really freaking wanted it. And they stayed in contact with the recruiter for six months or, or they went and got like some level of experience. Maybe they invested them in themselves in some way, shape or form to show that like, hey, listen, I'm serious about my investment as a sales professional. It doesn't have to be like a financial investment, but it could be like, hey, I'm like, I, I, um, I love trying to think about examples. Like I got a certification from LinkedIn, for example, or um, I have been like subscribing to these newsletters and like you're applying that and sending out like messages and emails to like different people at different organizations who are hiring managers and can like introduce you to those folks. But like there are just so many things that you can do that will show just how great you are that have nothing to do with your experience level or your college degree. So like my advice is just, you know, be prepared to ace the interview and like use all these tips that are being shared. It's not rocket science. Like salespeople are not rocket scientists. Like it's not, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not, yeah, selling is hard, but I would say, but you don't need to be a genius to be a good salesperson. You just have to like work hard, recognize where your weaknesses are, know your strengths, play to your strengths, have a plan for your weaknesses. Here's a tip. If somebody, like one of the things you can do is say, hey, listen, hey, Elric, like, uh, let's say it's your question time, right? Hey, Elric, I, I, um, I know I don't, I know I'm not coming in here with experience into the SDR role. And here are the three ways that I'm prepared. Like, here's what I know about the SDR role in terms of like challenges. Here's how I'm going about addressing those challenges. So you don't have to worry about it. I'm just really curious though. What else should, what else do you think I should be doing to make sure that I'm shortening my learning curve? They're literally addressing every concern I could potentially have. And then also when you're asking the question of, hey, what would you recommend I do on top of that to make sure whatever? Or like, hey, you know, like I feel really good about this because here's the research that I've done. Here's how I've prepared myself. You know, like um, not just like, hey, what concerns do you have? But hey, manager, what's been your experience in or what have you seen as some of the biggest challenges that someone with no sales experience has in their first like one to three months of the role? And then show like, tell me or um, and then tell me a story that illustrates how you supported that person. What did you do? What happened? What were the results? Right? Because you also want to make sure that when you're interviewing at these places, that the hiring manager, the person that you're going to entrust your career with, can actually support you in the way that you need to be supported. Right? So that should also be a qualifier for you. Is like, if they've never done it, they don't know the challenges, they're blissfully unaware, that's not your hiring manager. Run. Go find somebody who knows how to support you and is, and is not intimidated by your lack of experience. Um, I really like the way you mentioned that because I think you were earlier in the conversation you were talking about the bets for the hiring manager, but now you are showing you can do the job even though you don't have experience or any degree, college degree. So that yeah, that was super insightful. So thank you so much for sharing this on the show. So do you have anything else you want to add uh, before we wrap up the episode? There is a, a bunch of advice out there about best ways to like rock an interview and and I'm thinking about this from like how I lead the folks on my team who are SDRs is I I'll always I we always start off with what are you filling your pipeline with right not just who are the people but it's like what are the accounts and why right so when you're getting to your interview process you the interview interviewing is a dog fight like my, my friend, I got friends who've been interviewing for a year, like a year now. It is, it can be so brutal. And so like, if you're an SDR and C and you're just calling through a list aimlessly, the job gets awful quickly. So instead, what I'd highly recommend again, it's like taking the time to really reflect on what are you trying to do in your career? 
long term, right? Like, and it, it doesn't have to be 20 years out. We could just be like, hey, like, where do you want to be two roles from now? Just two. Where do you want to be two roles from now? And like, what kind of experience do you want to have? And also think about what are your strengths? What are you really good at already? Like, for me, I, w- I would always tell folks, I'm like, hey, listen, I'm a great learner. Okay. Like, I might not have it right away, but I can get it and I love to learn. So I actually want to go to places that don't have things figured out because I want to learn how to figure it out. So you got to know your strengths. You got to know what you like, what you can't deal with either. If you have experience working with, with anybody or being taught by anybody who's a micromanager and you hated it, you need to assess for that in your interviews too, right? So if you really have an, a strong idea of, okay, what am I trying to accomplish? Let's say, where do I want to be two roles from now? What do I need to get there? What must be true for me to get there and to enjoy the process of getting there? Then you can start to figure out, okay, what are the traits of the companies that I need to look for? And what are the traits of my hire of my manager that I need to assess? And so if you get really, really good at that, you will have a super compelling why for the role. You will be prepped and ready to, it'll be just so much easier to interview as well. You're going to invest a deeper level of effort into your interview experience too, because you've got that strong why. And that will reflect to your hiring managers too, right? So like, I can tell you all the questions to ask. I can tell you all the things that you can do after that. But if you get really, really good at be like, selecting of like, what is my ideal like employer profile and what is my ideal manager profile, you will quickly discern which opportunities are for you, which ones are not. And then when you know what's for you, you'll be able to show up highly invested versus trying to like be anything and everything to everybody knowing full well that's like not going to work for you. So I would, I just, that's the biggest thing that I want to stress is just like really know what, like know what you're trying to do, know what it takes to get there, know what you have to offer already. Like what do you have right now that makes you more than enough? And then just have a talk track for, and why should a hiring manager not be concerned about any potential gaps that you have. It's totally okay to have gaps. You should have gaps, right? Just have a talk track so that the hiring manager is like, hey, listen, they know they got gaps. I know they got gaps. They know they have a plan. I can support them. Wonderful. And I think if you do that, you you really will stand out head and shoulders from the majority of people interviewing. Thank you so much for all the, the insights you shared. I think that's going to be super helpful for the audience. Awesome. Thanks everyone for listening to this episode and I see you on the next episode. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. So for Spotify, to leave a review, what you can do is you can use your phone, then go on the Spotify app, then you go to the SDR game page and then at the top of the page, you can leave um, a review. It's a a five-star review uh, if you enjoyed the episode, obviously. And then if you are listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts, feel free also to leave a review uh, on your app. Thanks for listening and I see you on the next episode.